after nearly 15 years of teaching people how to tune engines, I find a lot of questions constantly come up time and time again. And one of the most popular questions that I get is, how do I know what is the right target lambda or air fuel ratio for my engine? It's typically regarded as one of the most secretive things about engine tuning. Seems like there's always some tuner with his own secret formula hiding behind a curtain that doesn't want you to know how to get the performance out of your vehicle. Well, it turns out it's really not that much of a secret and it's actually pretty simple to figure out what's the right combination for a given engine. To understand how simple that is though, we really need to get the concept of why we're changing the air fuel ratios in the first place. If you think about what the goal is for your engine, it really helps define what you need to do. For example, let's say that the only goal that I had was to make sure that I put enough fuel into the engine so that it starts and runs. You might be pretty surprised to find out just how wide open that window of choices could be. Most modern engines will actually start up and run as rich as eight or nine to one air fuel ratio, and they'll continue to run all the way up to 17, 18, maybe 20 to one air fuel ratios. So if the only goal was to make the engine run, you could literally pick anything you want, and most engines will do that. The challenge comes in though, when we start adding things on top of that goal. Well, I didn't just want my engine to run. For example, I also wanted it to make lots of power or I wanted it to have good reliability, or maybe fuel economy or emissions. So depending on what your goal is, will have a great effect on what your actual target lambda should be. Let's take a look at some of the different topics. We're gonna to provide a link for you to download a document that's called NACA report number 189. This is a report that was a government-sponsored survey by a bunch of scientists to try to find out the relationship of fuel air ratio to engine's performance. When you read through this report, they answer some really interesting questions, not the least of which would be, what air fuel ratio gives me the most power and how would I get the most economy out of my engine? So we're gonna talk about some of these piece by piece, but we wanted to make sure that you understand this is not something we just made up or this is not something that's just our opinion. It's something that can be proven and has been proven time and time again throughout the years. So have a look at that report from the download and read through it and I think you'll find that it's pretty accurate. As we get into understanding what air fuel ratio makes maximum power, we sort of need to talk about how we make power in the first place. You see, we're putting things into the cylinder like fuel and air, and we're converting them and trying to change their energy into something that helps us make our car go. So through the combustion process, we're gonna use the energy available in the fuel to create horsepower. So one of the units that's typically thrown around is something called BTUs, or British Thermal Units. The definition of a BTU is the amount of energy that it would take to raise one pound of water, one degree, in one minute. So if we were converting between BTUs and horsepower, a conversion is that one horsepower would equal 2,544.43 BTUs every hour. Let's put that into perspective. A typical gallon of gasoline would contain an average about of 112,800 BTUs. So the more gallons we put into the engine, the more potential we have to create energy and make horsepower. So let's see how well that happens in a standard engine. If we had an engine making 300 horsepower, our brake specific fuel consumption dictates that we'd be consuming about 25 gallons of fuel every hour. Now, wait a minute, 25 gallons of fuel and each gallon has 112,800 BTUs? Well, a quick math formula tells me that that's 1,108 horsepower worth of gasoline. Uh, where did all of our power go? Because that would mean that if we're actually making 300 horsepower as measured at the crankshaft, then we're only converting about 27% um, of the heat from combustion into horsepower. That means that 73% of our potential to make power is getting lost in the combustion process. We're losing it to heat draining out the, you know, the cylinders from friction and other things like that. I'll give you a real life example. A common 3.5 liter V6 engine typically consumes about 75 horsepower worth of friction at 6,800 RPM. So that means for you to make 300 horsepower at the crankshaft, you have to be making a lot more than that in the cylinder. 
we lose a lot of power through things like friction and heat. We lose heat to the engine components, the cylinder walls, as well as out the exhaust port. So here's the thing. If 70 some odd percent of the heat we're creating we have to get rid of, and we're not careful, we can easily make so much heat that we overwhelm the structural components of the engine and we end up with a failure. So one of the reasons that we typically would add extra fuel to the engine, meaning, well, I'm gonna add more fuel than how much it takes just to make the power level I want, is because putting that fuel in there, it may not change how much power I'm making, but it does help me control the heat and it protects the engine. Of course, adding extra fuel hurts economy, so we have to find the balance between engine protection and efficiency. We have to think about running the engine richer in terms of what we call thermal management. You'd find in that NACA report that a very wide range of air fuel ratios produces the same average power output. So we want to base our choice of air fuel ratio on providing good thermal protection when needed and good efficiency at times when that's more desirable. As we start to think about what would be the right target lambda or air fuel ratio for our engine, the most important factor is that the first thing we do is define what the goal is. As we said earlier, if the only goal was to try and get the engine to run, we have a big range of air fuel ratios that would work for us. But as we narrow that down and start to add other things that we might desire, we could zero in in about four different categories. So some people would say making maximum power is most important. Others might say reliability. Again, others economy and last some might say emissions. One of the things that we want to consider is that because we're mostly dealing with something called thermal management, we only have to worry about overwhelming our engine components when we're making a lot of power. Think about how much horsepower we might produce for a given engine. Let's say, for example, I was making 1,000 horsepower. Well, 1,000 horsepower is a specific amount of heat, as we saw earlier, because it's a conversion from BTUs. So whether or not that's good or bad for the life of the engine is a function of, well, how big is your engine? For example, imagine if you had a two liter racing four cylinder engine that had to make a thousand horsepower. That's a tremendous amount of heat to be absorbed into a package that you and I could probably pick up and carry around. But if you had a giant large cubic inch V8 drag racing engine to make a thousand horsepower, eh, it's really not that big of a deal. There's a lot of mass to absorb all that heat. So those two engines might want different air fuel ratios, even though they're both making a thousand horsepower. Another thing to consider is the way the engine's being used. Even if I had two of the same engines, let's say that I had two big block Chevy engines. One of them gets used in a drag race car. The other gets used in an offshore powerboat. So even though they're both making the same power production, the drag race car only has to sustain that level of heat for five to 10 seconds, let's say. Whereas an offshore powerboat, we might have to open the throttle and make that power, but maintain that level of power for 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 minutes. So when we start thinking about the balance between the power we make and the reliability of the engine, we start shifting what our choice is for air fuel ratio. So looking at those four categories, you might place power as the highest priority. And as you would see by looking at some of these reports that we're talking about, Typically anything between about an 11 to 1 and a 14 to 1 air fuel ratio for gasoline would make the most power, meaning there's very little change in power output with a fairly significant change in air fuel ratio. Now you may be thinking, that's not true. I've heard lots of tuners tell me that the engine's very sensitive to air fuel ratio changes. That is typically not what you would see on an engine dyno. It's also not what has been recorded by the government testing in that NACA report. So really, after a hundred years or so of having an internal combustion engine, not very much has changed. So I wouldn't really call this cutting edge or latest and greatest information considering those guys in that NACA report found the same results in 1922 when they ran the test. Okay. So since we've established that how to make power is pretty easy and we have this big window of air fuel ratio, what we have to do next is prioritize out of those four categories of how much power, how reliable, the fuel economy, and the exhaust emissions, right? So for the operating state of the engine, what we want you to do is prioritize those four things and then we can choose the range of air fuel ratios that might work. So for example, my priorities for that offshore powerboat 
might be reliability first and horsepower second, and then maybe fuel economy third and exhaust emissions, well, that sort of gets thrown out the window. However, the drag racer, he might consider his priorities to be horsepower first and reliability second because the engine doesn't have to run that long. Whereas with the boat, if we don't finish till the end of the race, we certainly can't win the race. So since a wide range of air fuel ratios basically makes the same power on those two engines, the guy with the drag race engine might pick 12 and a half or 13 to one air fuel ratio. And the guy with the power boat might pick 11 and a half or 12. The main difference is in the thermal reaction of the engine. We're using that extra fuel when we're running it rich to carry some of that heat out the exhaust and out to the atmosphere faster than we could absorb it into the cylinder and transfer it to the radiator and so on and so forth. Since we've established that reliability is a function of thermal management and the amount of heat that the engine's making, and that choosing an air fuel ratio that makes the most power is fairly simple because the engine doesn't respond to big changes in air fuel ratio, we get left with exhaust emissions and fuel economy. Out of all these four categories, the exhaust emissions is probably by far the easiest one to get because to achieve the cleanest emissions, what you'd like to have is a chemically balanced air fuel ratio where there's no excess of hydrocarbons or leftover oxygen. So that means when you're operating the engine in a state that would require you to have clean emissions, you would wanna target a stoichiometric air fuel ratio. Now the downside to a stoichiometric air fuel ratio is that if you chose to use that under very high power conditions, you would lose the benefit of that thermal management and you could easily damage the engine. But here's the lucky part. The engine operates over a wide range of air fuel ratios and a wide range of conditions. It might be at high RPM and full load. It might be at low RPM and partial throttle conditions. And each one of those allows us the opportunity to specify a different air fuel ratio. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a target lambda table in the ECU that's laid out quite a bit similar to our base fuel table where we have load on one axis and RPM on the other axis. And any square in the table allows us free resolution change. In other words, what we can do is we can pick a different target for any RPM or any load that we want. That means when the engine's starting or it's idling, you could pick a different air fuel ratio than you might use when the engine's at cruise and a different one again when it's under wide open throttle. You might pick a different condition when the engine has no boost or when the engine has high or low boost. So the beauty of a fuel injection system is we're not tied down to just one air fuel ratio that has to fit all of our different circumstances. We have a lot of flexibility to choose any air fuel ratio we want over a large range of engine operating conditions. Lastly, let's talk about how to get better fuel economy out of your engine. Remember that everything that we've done so far is dealing with thermal management. And typically, we're not going to be trying to get the best fuel economy at the same time we're trying to get the most power. There may be some situations where this is important and it will affect your decision, but for the most part, when we're trying to get good fuel economy is when we're cruising. Maybe we're going down the highway and you know, you're listening to the radio or talking on your cell phone or something like that. So if you think about what's happening in that condition, let's say we're going 60 miles per hour and you're doing 2,500 or 3,000 RPM. Well, in order to maintain that speed in your vehicle, do you have to stay at full throttle? No, of course not. So since the throttle's mostly closed, what that does is it limits the power production of the engine. After all, isn't that what the throttle does? If you wanna slow the vehicle down, the first thing you do is take your foot off the gas pedal. Well, if I take my foot off the throttle and I limit the engine's power, what I'm doing simultaneously is limiting the amount of heat the engine's generating. Since I no longer have to worry about structurally damaging the engine because of heat, I can certainly choose a leaner air fuel ratio than I normally would under power. That alone is gonna save me some fuel expense. If you wanna get the best fuel economy though, we have to talk about specific range and we wanna look at how far did I get or how much power did I make for a given amount of fuel. This is an area that some people get really confused on, especially when talking about the difference between brake specific fuel consumption and air fuel ratio. We've talked a lot about brake specific fuel consumption and the definition is that it means how many pounds of fuel we use to make a horsepower. It's in pounds per horsepower per hour. A lot of tuners that are from the quote unquote old school believe that you could just tune the engine to achieve a specific BSFC number and things will be okay. 
The problem with that thinking is that there's more than one way to make our engine run rich or lean. So for example, if I was to hold the throttle wide open, the amount of air moving through the engine won't change very much, so I can make the engine richer by adding fuel. But since adding that extra fuel does not bring with it any extra oxygen, the reality is the horsepower production of the engine won't change, it'll just get richer. So when we look at our BSFC numbers, what'll happen is I'll say, well, gee, now I'm using a lot more fuel, but I'm still making the same power, so now I have a less efficient engine. My BSFC has gone down. If we start to go the other way and we intentionally lean the mixture out, we still have the same amount of air. But if we take away enough fuel, eventually there won't be enough to consume all of the air. So what happens is if I wanna make the most power possible, I need to make sure there's enough fuel to get all of the air burned. So I wanna have an excess of fuel. But if the goal is to make the best economy, I wanna make sure that I don't waste any fuel. So I wanna have an excess of air so there's always enough to burn all of the hydrocarbons. But just for a second, imagine another way that I could make the engine run rich. What if I kept the fuel supply to the engine the same, but I say stuck a banana in the tailpipe? What if I limited the amount of air the engine was able to move, but I left the fuel the same? Wouldn't I still get the same rich air fuel ratio? I would. The only difference is now I would see a dramatic change in power because the engine's an air pump and the less air we would be moving, the less power it makes. Have you ever heard anybody say the engine's a fuel pump? In other words, if I double the amount of fuel I put in the engine, does it double the power? No, of course it doesn't. The engine's an air pump, not a fuel pump. All right, so by now you should have figured out that the engine would like to have a different goal or target for lambda or air fuel ratio depending on the operating scenario. So what you as the tuner need to do before you start the tuning process is determine for each RPM and each load what you want the target to be. You see, that's the way you're actually gonna tune the engine anyway. When you're playing in the base fuel table and you're making those numbers bigger or smaller, the whole job of the base fuel table, or what we would call the VE table, is it allows the tuner to match the actual engine airflow to your target lambdas or air fuel ratios. If you haven't set a target in the first place, how are you gonna know when you get the right number in the table? So when you have a lean air fuel ratio relative to your target, you'll make the numbers in the table larger to add more fuel. When it's rich, you'll have to make those numbers smaller. Now. We've covered everything so far about how to choose an air fuel ratio and all the factors that determine how much fuel the engine requires. What we'd really like to know is how does an ECU put all of this stuff together and actually come up with a calculated injection event to get from all these funny numbers in the table to what really happens at the fuel injectors. All right, in the next video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through all the steps that the ECU does to calculate this injection event. All the stuff we've talked about so far is leading us up to that, and I wanna make sure that you understand how the ECU does that. To do that, you're gonna to need to bring your calculator.